Hello, everyone. I'm Danny Warshe. I'm the executive director of the Nelson Center for Entrepreneurship. And I would normally be tempted if we were in person to say good afternoon. Uh, I'd be remiss if I did, however, because we have people today joining us from all over the world. And I'll just give you a sample of where you're calling in from, from the UK, from Mexico, from India, from Canada, France, and all over the place in the United States across several different time zones, including North Carolina, Colorado, California, even uh, Carla herself is calling in from California, New Jersey, New York. And Adam, I know you're, should I blow your cover? You're, you're, uh, you're participating from beautiful St. Thomas when it's snowing here in Providence. So again, um, so excited that we have the opportunity to include you all from all places around the world and across the country. So whether it's good afternoon or good morning uh, or good evening, we're, we're thrilled to have you here. I'm just going to mention a couple things about uh, this event and put it in some context. I want to highlight a couple of upcoming events as well. Make sure on your radar are the Hazeltine Mentorship Award Ceremony on May 6th. Uh, you can nominate uh, one of our someone to become a peer entrepreneur in residence. Uh, you do that also by May 6th. And then stay tuned for events that will coming, be coming up all through the summer, especially for first and second year students who will be experiencing uh, an academic semester over the summer. And a lot of those are sponsored through our student-led club, uh, the Entrepreneurship Program, or EP. Uh, I want to thank Carla and Adam for being here uh, on our panel, and I'm going to turn the program over to Professor Don King in a second, but I thought I would just give you a little bit of context. Issues related to climate change, solving problems relating to climate change are one of our two uh, priority themes at the Nelson Center. And um, the other one is solving problems related to anti-Black racism and systemic racism. And uh, those two pillars of themes relate to the overall mechanism that we teach, that I teach in the classroom, and that we uh, expose our students to and our whole community to in and out of the classroom, and that we encourage our students to address through the venture support we provide, in addition to lots of other themes. But those are two priority ones. We can't think of any that are even close to being as consequential as those, especially this year and for the next um, coming years, there will be others that we add to those themes. Uh, and I wanna thank Dawn and her colleagues at IBIS um, for collaborating with us, especially on the theme related to climate change and issues related to sustainability. There are other elements of that theme that we try to emphasize. We um, are providing venture grants uh, and you can learn about those on our website. Those are gr venture grants for innovative solutions that address climate change. Uh, and we're also providing funding through um, generous support from uh, a donor to encourage students to spend their summer doing internships in startup related environments that also are working on climate change issues. So uh, today's event is one of those co-curricular events where we draw on the support and expertise of wonderful alumni like Carla and Adam. And we uh, invite somebody uh, like Dawn, who has such a loyal following among our students. Uh, I could describe Dawn's background in, in a lot of detail. I'm gonna let her maybe weave that in. The only thing I'll say is, anytime I mention the name Dawn King, students' faces light up with a very big smile. And uh, that's probably the best thing I could say in terms of uh, Dawn's background and the uh, wonderful generosity and encouragement she has for our students. So thank you for being here today, Dawn. Thank you again, Carla and Adam. And I'm gonna turn the program uh, over to Dawn. Well, first of all, Danny, that is probably the best introduction uh, you could give me. Certainly, uh, you know, as many of you know, it's it's you know really an honor and a pleasure to teach at Brown and to work with students like Carla and Adam, who are about to speak with us today. Um, and also, I just wanted to mention that it's just so wonderful that the Nelson Center has really focused on climate change and sustainability. Um, and so, I actually am with the Institute of Brown for Environment and, and Society, 
where I'm a director of undergraduate studies for environmental studies and sciences. And certainly we have an interdisciplinary program that overlaps uh, so brilliantly with the Nelson Center and um, a lot of the goals that the Nelson Center has set. So it's, it's always my pleasure uh, to moderate some of these panels and uh, hear what these wonderful alums have to say and, and, and what they're doing. So, well, I will let uh, allow Carla and Adam to, to introduce themselves. I would just like to welcome both of you. Uh, and today we have uh, speakers. Um, Adam Fitarello is a graduate of 2005 and co-founder and president of Optoro, uh, which is a global leader in solving problems in retail returns. Um, and I, I know a lot about Optoro because I've had former students who have worked with Adam. And I know a lot of the brilliant things that you guys are doing and really leading the inter industry in many ways. Uh, and I'd also like to welcome Carla Gallardo, uh, to another 2005 graduate and co-founder of Kuyana. And I think what best wraps up is it, it's really a mantra of uh, better but fewer fashion choices. Um, and so with that, I, I will allow you to, to yourself, uh, introduce yourselves uh, a little more fully. And we'll begin with Carla. Thanks, Don. Super excited to be here. Um, you know, since I graduated from Brown, I always wanted to come back in some way. And finally, I got, out, I got my head out of the you know building moment from Kuyana and, and I, I'm in touch again with Brown. So I'm, I'm really excited for today. Um, graduated in 2005, same class as Adam. Uh, we, we interacted a few times back then. Um, but I focused actually my time at Brown doing applied mathematics. And so I didn't imagine myself being an entrepreneur back then, um, you know, but just the, the ability to take other classes and just experience more things allowed me to just think of ideas. And um, the very raw idea of Kuyana was born while um, I was studying there. And um, I graduated, I did my thing, I went to banking back then, that was kind of the track for us, uh, international kind of, you know, business backgrounds. Um, so I worked at Goldman for a few years, and then I decided it's time to, to really move forward with this idea of Kuyana. Um, I didn't feel ready to do it yet. And so I, 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 um, I got an MBA in between, I went to Stanford graduated, worked a little bit on an online store, on the online store at Apple to learn e-commerce, and then launched Kuyana in 2011. Um, and as Don explained that the philosophy of Kuyana really is, um, it, it's all about fewer, better things. You know, back when I was at Brown, I it was I just arrived from Ecuador. That's where I grew up. And um, we consume very differently in Ecuador. And I was just very surprised uh, to see just the different way of living, of buying, um, also seeing the wide range of, you know, quality of products. And um, I just thought, you know, if customers were more connected to what they purchased, maybe they would love their products more. They would treasure what they have more. Um, in Ecuador, we invest in, in everything we buy. I mean, my dad would always be very proud of his 20 year old shoes uh, and how many times he would change the soles of his shoes. And that's just something that was, you know, I didn't hear uh, here in, in, in the US as much as when I, when I when I came and so, um, you know, Kuyana is kind of the result of all of that. And it turns out that by the time I was ready to launch it, the fast fashion bubble burst, uh, you know, and, 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 um, and there was, it was time where customers just started to demand better quality, better production conditions for workers and factories. Um, and so here we are, I'll tell you guys more about it and won't take over the whole hour. <laughs> Adam. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, good to see you guys. Thanks so much for having me, Don. Um, it's great to connect with with Carla again. Um, didn't think kind of our past maybe would cross <laughs> cross like this. We were actually both um, good friends with uh, with with another kind of mutual friend, a Brazilian mutual friend who kind of went down the hallway from me freshman year, and I, and I was good friends with Carla. Um, but thank you guys so much for having me. Um, I love, love Brown. Um, I think Carla and I both kind of had similar paths. I mean, in the sense that I certainly was not thinking about entrepreneurship when I was at Brown. I kind of grew up, honestly, with a bit of a, you know, business is bad mentality. Um, and, you know, you got to kind of go out there and solve problems in spite of business as opposed to with business. Um, I graduated, I did international relations and history at Brown. Actually, when I graduated, I actually had a job with AIG. And um, my whole goal was I knew that they would pay the same salary in Buenos Aires as they would in New York. And so if you went to work in New York, 
um, you then could come back and then basically translate or you know, transfer after a year and move down to Buenos Aires. So that was my that was my plan upon graduation. I actually ran into a few friends um, who had started a kind of a tangential company right out of school, and I started helping them out. And I didn't start until it may I June until August fifteenth. And so in those two months after graduating, I actually kind of said, oh, this is pretty cool. And I kind of said, actually, you know what, I'm going to, uh, and I kind of had a real existential, hey, should I, should I do AIG? It seems very secure and safe. Should I do this small startup? So I started to join the startup as a, as a co-founder with two of my high school friends. Turns out at the time, AIG probably had a higher likelihood of going bankrupt than the, um, than the small company did, a little unbeknownst to me. Um, and so, yeah, I've been was doing that for a while, just a small company kind of living in the basement, you know, doing the entrepreneurship thing. And then in 2010, um, started, started Optoro and, you know, what Optoro is about and, and, and very much in a similar vein to, to Carla, um, really all about how to make retail more circular and sustainable um, as we're trying to basically better repurpose goods. Um, and so I think part of the whole, you know, how do you build a more circular, sustainable um, consumption is around building things that last more to Carla's point super important. And I think another part of it is just making it easy to kind of repurpose the goods you no longer want. And that's kind of what we're in the in the space of from a technology perspective. And I think probably like like Carla, I think kind of started with like uh, utter appallment. I mean, just appalled by by the sheer number of goods that perfectly good goods from huge retail brands that were being basically thrown away. It still happens, by the way, where like tons, millions of good good items get just basically sent to the landfill. And so we said, hey, there's got to be a better way to make these things repurposable and kind of get them back in the hands of folks that need them. Like baby goods, for example, almost all of them get thrown away. And I remember my sister when she had her first kid was like, I can't find baby goods at a discount. And, and I saw literally truckloads and truckloads of them kind of ending up in the landfill. So, so yeah, that's what we do as a technology company. We, we do have a, a few brown folks. Actually, I just interviewed a great um, brown grad from a few years ago for our product team um, just a little while ago. Um, if you guys are interested, always, always hiring. But, um, but yeah, that's what we're in the space that we work with big retail brands like Best Buy and Staples, American Eagle, Williams Sonoma, help them just basically better repurpose goods through technology. So anyway, I'll, uh, I'll stop talking. Um, and again, I'm, I am, I am in St. Thomas. So I apologize. <laughs> my wife's from down here. I was very lucky in my marriage. Uh, and so I'm with the in-laws down here and we're coming back tomorrow. Um, but, um, but yeah, that's, that's, that hints the uh, Caribbean background. So anyway, thanks so much for having me. Well, thank you to, to both of you. And it's so wonderful to have panelists that are approaching, you know, a, the exact same problem from two completely different angles. Um, and I think that's sustainability in a nutshell, right? Every, everything is completely interconnected. And so the, the first question I, I wanted to ask the two of you, um, you know, first was sustainability always part of your business strategy? And then, and really the follow-up to that, uh, assuming that it probably maybe has been, um, if so, how has that evolved over time? Um, and especially, I mean, you all have been in the business now for a while. And so really kind of how those roots of sustainability started, but also if you've seen any evolution um, since the founding of your companies. Uh, and so this time I'll, I'll start with Adam. Sure, yeah, you know, um, I guess probably as all good Brown students, I mean, probably irked by having just waste in general. So I think like, you know, sustainability from a concept I mean, certainly reuse and repurposing has always been core to what we do and making that as easy as possible. We actually started out more like consumer to consumer, moved into businesses. And so always, and it was always at the heart of the problem we were trying to solve, which is like, hey, this just doesn't make any sense for these types of goods to be thrown away or otherwise kind of not repurposed on scale, on the scale they are. And like, oh, there's no one else doing it. So might as well be us. Um, we didn't honestly call it like it wasn't like, you know, called out. It was always just, hey, that's something that's really near and dear to us. And certainly we're big believers in the kind of um, the and type solutions where like the profitability gets achieved and you also hit the sustainability goals. I think that sustainability um, focused companies that do that at the expense of customers or profits just don't work. And so I think you have to be both a great customer experience like Carla, like when I say tell my wife that, um, you know, I was talking to Carly, oh my God, their products are fantastic. Like that has to be, a, a, I mean, at least in my mind, a necessary ingredient, like great products plus great solutions. Um, and so it wasn't like at the expense of it, it was always kind of part of the value prop. I will say, and then we hired a head of sustainability in 2013 
who works directly for me. Um, and she was there for a long time. We just got a new one. So it's, it's become more incorporated. And like, you know, Optoro's mission is to make retail more sustainable by eliminating all the waste around returns. And so it is, and there's, there's environmental waste, but also financial waste and operational waste, and customer waste. So it's been near and dear. I would say, um, and I'd love to hear Carlos' um, points of view on it. From our standpoint, just in the last year um, with COVID, there's been a tremendous amount of where it was like a tertiary or like a nice to have. We're actually starting to see big retail customers come to us and say, our customers are demanding that we're more sustainable. And so part of the thing we're trying to solve with you guys is actually to put in place more sustainable supply chains and more sustainable practices. And so it's actually going from not being a buying motivator for almost any company, being kind of a nice to have to actually being a primary or secondary buying motivation for, I'd say, a good chunk of our deals coming in. And almost everyone now talks to it. So um, silver lining of pandemic, you know, as Danny said, not, not necessarily, it's been a tough year, but certainly it's gotten people, I think, focused on how do you be more good stewards of the planet? And we're definitely seeing that. And Carla, how, how have you seen uh, sustainability evolve? Yeah, um, it's um, so it's always been part of our business model. I mean, the, our our motto has been fewer, better things, and really, it's um, it just goes back to um, to um, buying less and producing less. And so, our goal, our ultimate um, sustainability goal, is to uh, minimize the amount of product that goes to landfill. And um, and to achieve that goal, we uh, we have a three prone approach. So there's the responsibility that we have as a brand putting product to market, but then there's also the education and kind of help we give our customers to also do better on their end. And so what we do as Kuyana is we focus on producing responsibly. And uh, what that means is you know, um, putting incredibly high quality product to market that lasts a very long time. Um, we, um, we are very focused on um, sustainable materials. So materials that if they end up in landfill, they won't um, damage the planet. Um, and then the third thing is on the production side is just producing as close as possible to demand. And to do that, our business model focuses on best sellers. So rather than being a fashion brand that just you know puts trendy product out to market all the time, new product all the time, um, only 20% of our product, uh, of our total product, um, um, is newness, the rest is bestsellers, and it's a business that we know and we can predict really well. And so, um, so the amount, of, so our forecasting is, is pretty accurate um, because of that. And so we, we don't end up with product on our shelves that then we have to liquidate and or figure out what we do with. Um, and then on the consumer side, there are two things that we that really focus on. The first one is on her maximizing wares. Our philosophy of Fura Better is buy a product you love, and wear it over and over again, dress it up and down, right? Um, you know, our, the, the, the most exciting things for us are to see customers. Hello. Am I supposed to talk to you? Sorry. Oh, sorry. I'll mute her. Um, um, the most exciting thing for us is when we hear a customer have, you know, wearing her tote for five years every day to work. Like, those are the things that really excite us. Um, so we have tools for her to do that. You know, we, we invest a lot in photography. We have lookbooks online. Like that's the communication we give her, how to make really great use of her product. And we also have, um, you know, product lines that we're starting to launch to care for the product, right? So when it gets damaged, like if your leather bag, you know, starts to scratch or is dirty, well, here are some products for you. There's leather care products. Um, we were hopeful that last year, when the pandemic happened, we were going to start having mending services in our stores, right? If you need to mend your clothes, come to us, we'll, we'll fix that so that you can really extend the life of that product while it's yours. And then the, the, the last piece is extending the life of that product. So there will be a time when it's time to part ways with that product. And we want to facilitate uh, our customer being able to potentially give a second, third, fourth life to that product. Because if we produce something that's very lasting and has, has such high quality, then eventually she can place it in other hands. And so we have a program we've partnered with um, ThreadUp who, um, you know, is a, they, they facilitate reselling those products. We also um, uh, have donation programs or our customer can also choose to donate her product to another woman who will make use of it. Um, so those are kind of, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a long answer. It's kind of a three prone approach, produce responsibly, maximize wares and extend life. We talk about it internally all the time. And, you know, the exciting thing I think about the last 
I mean, since we started the business is that we've been able to do better in all those three, just because the industry is, you know, the supply chains are getting better. Um, the consumer is demanding more and is more aware and wants to actually participate in it. Um, but there's a lot more work to do. I think, you know, the, the part that the biggest challenge for us is just the supply chains aren't, um, um, they're, they're not evolving as fast as the ideas that we have. So in our ideal world, we would have a full circular situation where we could actually take in the product from our customer, upcycle it and create new, but the supply chains are not set up for that yet. And so we're working on that. Um, uh, but yeah, so there, there's, there's more to come. Well, it, I mean, it's wonderful that you're both, you know, this idea of a circular economy is really a structural change. I think as Carla was just alluding to, right? We can't do this on this end unless all of these other pieces come together. And so that really leads in, into my next question. And first, and you, you've mentioned them a little bit. Um, so the first part is really, what are the key challenges that the fashion industry faces? But in particular, I, I'm really interested um, in what are, the, what are these the key obstacles and problems that are unique to the industry. So Adam, I can imagine it's probably much easier to return a, you know, and get value for maybe like a PlayStation, right? That's returned versus a pair of socks. And Carly, you'd also mentioned really this, this rise of fast fashion, which we've seen. Um, and probably a lot of things that I'm not even thinking about. Um, so just in your opinion, you know, are there any issues, maybe not completely unique to fashion, but that issues that fashion really needs to, to deal with that maybe other uh, you know, waste reduction uh, areas do not. Um, and this time I'll, I'll start with you, Carla. Um, so I think a few things, you know, when, 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 when we talk a lot between founders of brands and, um, and um, I think the, the hardest thing for retailers that are already established is just their business models are conducive to just producing in excess, right? Putting product to market, see what sticks, and then if it doesn't, how to get rid of it, um, right? And so this, this, um, it, it's just the way that they work. So, so what does that end up? You know, um, the consequences of that are that you know the way that they talk to the consumer is they incite unintentional purchases. So she buys or he buys, right? And then they, those products don't end up being really fully used. And maybe they weren't right, and so they end up in landfill and or they end up being liquidated and they end up in landfill anyway. So um, just changing this, this the, the way that the businesses operate is just, it's, it's really hard, right? Because it's just ingrained in how, they, how these brands do business. And so um, I think these are the more act, most active conversations or the conversations we have with older retailers that reach out to us because um, that also kind of impacts their economics, right? In order to keep sustaining this model, right? They have to... Um, minimize costs of products, right? Because of they, you know, X percent ends up in liquidation and they have to sell it at a discount or they end up having to discard it into landfill and then the product suffers. So it's kind of like a never ending <laughs> prophecy where, right? The quality of the product is low. The conditions in which the products are made are low. They, the leap to making the product more sustainable is harder, right? Because it's more expensive to pay up for sustainable materials. And so it's kind of just like a never ending cycle and um, it's really hard to get out of that if the, that the way of working is is that so that I think that's the biggest challenge on the that that retailers face that they reach out to to us to kind of talk about and that that, that I'm aware of great and and Adam how how has Optoro uh, seen uh, fashion or at least obstacles that that are with fashion and uh, retail clothing? Yeah, I think we see a lot, and I echo a lot of what Carla says. I, I think there's a there's a few pieces to it. I think one is um, you got to make it financially sound to be able to repurpose goods and not have them go to landfill. And so I think you know there's a lot of so that's a lot of what we're trying to do. So just some examples is like now if you want to send something back, if you don't want it, if you're a consumer, um, you know you may have to pay five, six, seven bucks to. Um, contact, you know, with UPS or USPS or FedEx to ship it back. And so we're doing things like making it so that you can actually drop off those goods at any physical location across the country that's using our technology. So kind of like that Kohl's Amazon model or the Whole Foods Amazon model. We actually have a bunch of big retailers using our tech in their stores. And we're basically lighting them up as drop off locations so that it's much cheaper and it's more convenient for customers. They don't have to package it up, by the way. 
And so things like that. So if you can lower the cost, because I mean, you're talking about, you know, when we work with Target, for example, um, or Kohl's or two clients of ours, you know, they have 15, $20 items, right? And so, hey, and they're perfectly good, but like, if you want to repurpose it, you have to make it economically viable. Otherwise they're just going to tell the customer to keep it or they're just going to do something, you know, stupid, but hey, just throw it away as soon as you get it because it's not worth the cost. And so you both have to put in place the systems to make it kind of cheap to process. That's kind of a lot of what we do. And then um, to Carlos point around channels, you have to then kind of quickly get it to the next best channel and do it in an economically viable way. So I think just, I would second, I would like triple underline that the current retail system is not built this way. And so it's a linear system that takes stuff, you know, off out of the ground or off the tree or, you know, off an animal and ships it over and then, you know, tries to throw it against the wall and the things that don't sell kind of forget about it. And if they do sell 30% of it gets returned, it's a very linear model. So building circularity, I think, you know, companies like Carla's can go and, and um, do this from scratch and it's easier. Big companies like Kohl's and and target and stuff they're just not built that way and so certainly that's what we try to do it's not easy <laughs> to try to like build in circularity into the models um you got to make that happen ultimately though if consumers demand it that's how things happen right so if they say hey i'm only going to shop at brands like carlos then hey the person in marketing i mean ultimately growth and sales is what drives things and so if they're saying hey customers are just not buying with us because we're not circular we're not sustainable then someone's going to say we have to solve this so Honestly, there's a lot of power in the hands of consumers to change behavior because ultimately the brands, and by the way, you see brands like Patagonia, you know, doing this quite well or pretty well. And I think a lot of big brands, apparel brands out there are looking at folks and obviously like smaller brands like, like Carla's and saying, hey, these people are doing really well. They have a extreme follow, loyal following and we need to emulate that. And how do we do that? So ultimately that's going to drive the right behaviors. You then need the right systems and processes in place to be able to enable that circularity. Fantastic. And, you know, so a, a follow up to that, which actually does lead into my third question is, you know, this idea of, you know, consumer demand is kind of is really pressing the issue. So the first thing I want is if you step away from the consumer demand, um, do either of you think there's actually responsibilities from because that, you know, the whole circular model actually should shift it away from consumer demand and start placing responsibility on those who uh, produce the product to begin with? as far as their way. So it's, I, I was wondering if there's any movement in that direction to kind of sway it from individual choices. And it's kind of your problem if, you know, it's your fault if you're buying cheap clothes and that's bad you um, versus shifting that to the, the producer side and how, you know, how that would affect your business models. Um, but it also rolls into my other question, which is, you know, how are consumers ideas of sustainability changing and i'm very interested in how much of that is actually working in practice how much of that actually has a yet an effect versus this incredible amount of greenwashing because consumers demand consumers demand but when it comes down to it i'm not going to pay a hundred dollars for a shirt so i'll just go with the company that has all natural fabric or fiber or something written on the front um so how do you kind of see those those things interaction first of all it's kind of the the production side responsibility and the, and the other path is this this issue with goes on with clothing a lot which is greenwashing and Carla we'll start with you yeah hi <laughs> that's a very complex and hard question because I mean you're right Don you know it's um the responsibility lies on on both sides like it's the producer it's also the consumer it's not either or um it can't be and um Yes, producing responsibly costs more money. And we find that many times the customer is not ready to pay up for that, even though they would they would like that, right? And so you know, there are trade-offs that we actually make. Um, Adam talked about profitability, right? Like what? how do you handle that as a brand? We, um, we take hits when we introduce something new because it's you know, something that's, I'll give you an example. We just recently introduced um, single origin um, cashmere. And what that means is that in our cashmere is traced back to a single farm where you know, it's, um, it's picked ethically. And, um, and then we have a program where we upcycle that cashmere and we can continue to use it. So it's, it's um, the logistics to do that. And it's, it's, it's expensive to be able to trace, to do it right, right, and to, to be able to even eventually, right, upcycle that yarn um, when we get it back. Um, and, um, and, and, and so the cost of those sweaters, right, the ones that we end up making, like, they're way more expensive than the ones that we currently sell, right, when our, when our cashmere was only upcycled. 
Um, and we've done tests and um, it's the, as a, as our consumers don't, aren't able to quickly get there. So what we do is you know, when we introduce new, more sustainable materials, we take margin hit until we do education. And once uh, you know, our customer base is more aware of it, they're more educated, we actually end up increasing prices later so that eventually the business model ends up working for that program. Um, but it's, uh, it's tricky, right? Uh, it, 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 just, it costs so much more. I mean, I'll tell you 30 to 50% more to, to, to be, you know, to have more sustainable materials in our collection, which by the way, we already have a basis of sustainability, but if we wanna do, you know, up, use upcycled materials, then it gets just so much more expensive. And so, um, so, so as consumers, right, it's, it's, it ends up being our philosophy. And, and I don't mean, it, this is not a marketing thing, but it's fewer better, right? It's um, buying less so you can pay up, right, for better products, right? So it's not, you know, just going out of your budget. It's just being more thoughtful, buying less, less items, which will end up being more expensive if you actually right care care about the world. Uh, it's maximizing those wares, right? Like not having to buy buy much more. Um, and I had a third point that I'm forgetting about. Um, sorry, I'll, I'll come back. I'll go, oh, the greenwashing part and continuing to demand uh, because that is super important. So that right re retailers hadn't done anything until now because customers want it. And it turns out that, you know, there's still ways of getting away with unsustainable materials and make them look sustainable, right? Even how you write your labels. Um, there are companies that, you know, are built around saying that they're sustainably made or made of like upcycled plastic. And then you look under the covers, right? And you realize, oh, only 30% of their entire plastic that they're using is upcycled. Actually, they are producing, they're using 70% virgin. And so it's really demanding asking for transparency so that this whole system can continue to just evolve and get better. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely a, a complicated, um, complicated issue. I, you know, I, the question is like, you know, what's going to drive better behavior, carrot stick, you know, they have both or um, pro probably both. I, I would say um, in my mind, the ones that do this best are ones that um, make it good for the business and the consumer. So I mean, just one example, you know, Apple, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how much they advertise that, hey, you um, can send back your old phones and get a new one, but like they actually have built in a pretty solid circularity into their model. So have a lot of car companies, I mean, certainly Tesla, for example, I mean, you can send back your old car and they can repurpose it. I know I talked to someone that was running like Toyota use copy on cars and they're like, Hey, this is good for us. It's good for the environment. Cause now there's like wallet share out there. And so if they send back an old one and we repurpose it, then now they want to buy a new one. And so I think in my mind, that's the way you can drive the best behavior. I mean, I think there's some interesting things like financially as well. I think, you know, clever financials actually unlock a lot of things in my mind. And so like one example is, you know, could you do something kind of like blockchain esque where, you could see how many lives uh, a piece of material, you know, an item has so that if Carla makes something that's awesome and it gets repurposed, I don't know, five, six, 10 times that actually you can track that and they get paid residual on that. And so, I mean, that's basically what happens in, in Apple, right? It's like they're getting paid the residual on reuse. And so they have high motivations to build things to last and get reused because they're actually making money every time it comes back through the system. And so when you don't have that happen and you're actually only getting paid up front, I mean, forget clothing. What do you do? What does anyone do if all they do is get paid up front? <laughs> they're going to be optimized for like single use or little use. If you actually get paid. And so software went through this evolution. You know, what was old, old technology, you bought it once and that was it. Now SaaS, software as a service, you get paid residual. It's actually led to better quality technology. I think there could be similar things in the clothing space. Um, where actually if you can encourage more reuse and get paid for more reuse, both consumer wise and retailer wise. So imagine if you send something back and it kept getting reused and it said, hey, you know, that bag you no longer wanted is now being reused in Boise, Boise Idaho. And now it's being reused in, you know, Lima, Peru. And, and you got paid a little bit of that and, and the retailer got paid. Stuff like that, I think actually helps really make it work. If it's just stick, I think, you know, it's like recycling. I don't think recycling when it was just stick got a lot of traction. I think when people made it easy, and there was financial incentives that was part of a broader unlock. 
Um, and thank you, because I think that's a, a great segue to my my final question. Before we open it up uh, to everybody else, because we do want to make sure there's time um, for for those watching to ask their own questions. Um, but it's a great follow up. And you know, how do you balance? And especially, I think for a lot of participants that might be thinking about running their own, you know, starting a startup. Um, how do you balance the for-profit motivation with the need to make a positive impact on the planet? And I think maybe you all have kind of figured this out already, but I think it is really uh, very much a question for, you know, 18, 19, 20 year olds who are, who are developing ideas right now. And Adam, we'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, I really, um, I really strongly believe you kind of have to solve both, which may sound like a trite answer, but I mean, Ultimately, I think for Carla to be the success and not speak on her is like it has to be good for her business, right? If it was actually hurting her business to be sustainable, then I imagine probably long term wouldn't that wouldn't be sustainable. And so while it's a short term hit as she you know releases something new, I mean long term she's building brand equity, consumers like her, and so it's gonna it's gonna go. So I would challenge, I forget it was the actually the CEO of this big kind of um, bat body and bath company was saying, hey, they only basically buy into those type solutions, things that are gonna be both helpful to the bottom line, but also have a better impact. And so certainly I would challenge if you guys are thinking about it. I mean, I went from, again, kind of very anti-business to thinking you know, between government and nonprofits and for-profits, they all have a kind of seat at the table. And they actually, from my vantage point, there's actually no seat at the table for for-profits that don't solve some part of the problem. I mean, they don't have to, you don't have to be on your high horse about solving every social and, you know, inequality, but you need to make the world a better place than you got it. That's, that's just a, a table sticks for me for business. And so I think if you're doing that, you know, I also have shareholders and, you know, so for us, for example, since we started, we've had a multi-constituent scorecard that says 50% of it's financial and shareholders and kind of more near term and 50% of it's long term. We get we measure ourselves based on waste diverted, on how engaged our employees are, how happy our customers are, the volunteering we do, and we have a pledge one percent. We volunteer one percent of our time. It's critical. Like you have to make it. So I think you have to do all of them. You can't just say, "Hey, we're going to be a strong sustainability impact, but we're going to lose people more money, or we're going to have a worse customer experience." So I think if you can challenge yourself and find an innovative model that does both of those, then I think there's a ton of positive momentum. And by the way, you can see, um, the, the last point I'll say is you can see really the, um, when you look at someone like Tesla in the stock market and you say, yeah, God, this is crazy. How is this happening? I think part of that is people saying, you know what? I think what Tesla is doing is actually quite good for the world. And so I'm actually willing to kind of put some of my dollars that might've gone towards charity. And I'm going to put that towards like a charitable investment. It's kind of hybrid. It's not just for-profit that does bad and uh, nonprofit that does good. There's these in between. And so there's actually quite a lot of ESG environmental social good kind of interest in investing in companies that do good and they're also you know, kind of for good and for profit. And so I think if you can unlock that, there's a lot of market need and there's also a lot of investor need. And Carla, can I, if I could uh, shift the question just a little bit for you, because you, you know, you specifically just work in fashion. What, I mean, what are those things that, that would help you, you know, and Adam mentioned carrot or stick, but when you're talking about you know, if your company's competing against, you know, maybe a greenwashing company that's using plastic, well, you know, plastic is derived from fossil fuels, which is heavily, heavily, heavily subsidized, which automatically puts you, you know, kind of in a different position. So are, do you find anything within the fashion industry or just your company, um, things that you're pushing for, whether it's programs or policies or regulations or consumer education? Is there anything that you found that, that the fashion industry is really going all in on right now? Yeah. Um, well, no, I don't think the fashion industry is all in on 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 the subject yet, and and, and the aspects that it should. However, there is opportunity. Um, you know, I think the 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 where I see the most opportunities on upcycling um, and um, and uh, just. There's there there needs to be more innovation on that end so that we could be we can be better uh, and just in, in general the retail industry could be better and so you know yes there's a way, to Adam's point profitability you know it matters it can't be an afterthought to add sustainability after the fact because it costs money so it has to be part of your business model from the beginning right if 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 that's the goal if sustainability will be part of the business model eventually right it should, can't be an afterthought. Um, and if particularly in fashion, I, I do think that, you know, there's, um, yeah, there, there need, 
I'll tell you, right? There's um, there are a lot of trade-offs when you when you um, let me let me talk about cashmere. Sorry, cashmere, for example, right? Upcycling cashmere. There's a cost to the upcycle of the cashmere, but there's also a trade-off in the quality because when you upcycle cashmere, you cut the yarns and pieces. The fibers get cut in small pieces, and then you create a new yarn from it. Well, that yarn sheds more than what a virgin cashmere yarn would, right? And so there are also these trade-offs, right? So innovation needs to continue to happen so that we can continue to then provide high quality product to the customer that lasts. So there's huge opportunity to me, fashion or the retail side and clothing making, so exciting for a stronger sustainability angle, not only in the brand, like as a brand, but on the supply chain side, on the material making side and the technology for that, as well as traceability. Customers really care about learning more. And so, you know, Adam was talking about, Adam, by the way, if you ever hear of somebody launching, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the technology that will allow us to like show our customer where their product, that's, that's our dream to eventually visually be able to show your product has gone through all of these hands. That just fuels more, it just makes the customer want more of that and demand more of that, right? So it's just all kind of just grows together. But there are a lot of very exciting areas that just are starting to be tapped, right? They're untapped. Um, and, and, and so, yeah, I really hope brown people can, can enter them and, and, and yeah, uh, just improve uh, the world of, of retail and sustainability. I, and I think you make a great point about this idea of transparency, right? And traceability, because I think that's also a huge, something to stop that greenwashing. When you have this consumer demand and you don't have that, that trackability, traceability, transparency in the process, um, that's certainly something that I, I think can make, you know, move the needle in, in a certain direction. So that's Wonderful. Um, so we do want to open. We just have well, about 15 minutes now um, to questions from from the participants, uh, you know, from those in the audience of the panel. Um, I do have to say, I actually have to go moderate another conference panel um, right at noon. So I'm going to be leaving uh, a little early. So I will hand it over to a uh, Danny. I believe you're going to help with the the audience question and answer. So I'll, I'll stick on the line. Actually, I think Abby's going to facilitate, but oh, uh, I'm, I'll, I'm here Abby. too. Okay, Abby's gonna uh, facilitate. So I'm gonna stick on for about five more minutes because I'm interested to hear the questions, but I, I will I will probably have to leave um, about 10 minutes early, so. Thank you for Abby. doing this, Don. Oh, absolutely, it's my pleasure, this is great. Thank you, Don. Um, yeah, we have we have a question in the chat right now from Kara. Um, if you wanna mic down and ask your question, you're welcome to do so. And we also have a question for from Audrey uh, in the chat. Oh, okay. So it looks like her audio is not working. So um, she's listed in, in the chat with so many different industries, energy, agriculture, et cetera, that have the potential to touch sustainability and make a positive environmental impact. Why did you both uh, choose the, cons the consumer retail industry as a means for incorporating sustainability into your, oops, into human consumption and uh, company supply chains? That's the first one. Carla, you want to go ahead? Maybe you can answer the second part of that as well. Okay, sure. Yeah, I chose it because I was part. Like, it was the closest to me as a consumer. I saw it. It didn't look right. Wasn't you know? I didn't grow up seeing it that way. The just I shared just the amount of like consumption and then getting rid of it. It was like. <gasps> I couldn't, I, I mean, even Black Friday for me was like, what? People sleep outside the store to go and just <laughs> fight for products. So I, I couldn't believe it. Uh, so uh, yeah, it was just like what I experienced. And, you know, I, I just saw something different. And, and look, in Ecuador, it's financial need, right? People just don't have the means to purchase in that way. And so investments are thoughtful, but they're happier. So I saw that and I just thought there's an opportunity there. Um, and there's, you know, your second point on, on fast fashion has its issues, but it says another huge point is affordability. How do you balance the two? Well, financial inequality and making more informed and conscious purchases. So there's this thing that we talk about at Kuyana called uh, price per wear. And it's a concept that I really hope, you know, we can talk about when we talk about it externally too and I just hope that the consumer gets used to it more that other retailers get used to it more so price per wear is how much you pay to like the so it's 
the price of the product, right? Suppose a tote costs a hundred dollars and the amount, the, the times of uh, that you wear that product is in the denominator. And so the more you wear the product, the lower the price per wear is, right? We at Kuyana focus on minimizing that price per wear, right, to the cents. And what does that mean? It means that we need to make that product in the best quality possible so it can be worn, right, as many times as possible, right? And then the price we focus on the fair price. We want to make sure people are paid well. We need to pay out for sustainability, right? And yes, our totes, you know, may be priced at $175. And you know, an HM tote might cost $40. But guess what? When you realize how many times you're going to wear our tote, the price per wear actually ends up being lower than that fast fashion product because the fast fashion product will fall apart sooner, right? And um, you're not going to wear it for five, 10 years. Some customers have been wearing, we're going to be 10 years um, in a couple of weeks. Some customers have had their totes for eight years. I mean, imagine the price per wear of those products. It's like less than cents. So um, I think that's a different way of viewing it. There's just no way of lowering costs below a certain threshold. And yes, for affordability is a thing, right? And we're not going to satisfy or be able to allow everybody to afford our price. So we hope the price per wear is helpful in that. And then there's the second, third life, fourth life that we can give to those products, right? And so being able to resale market for products that will allow for those high quality products to be resold at lower price points is an opportunity as well there. Um, so it's a long answer, but I get very passionate about that. <laughs> I don't know, Adam, if you have anything to add. <laughs> no, that was great. We have another question from Audrey. Uh, how how has what you studied at Brown helped you on your career today? For either of you, that one. Yeah, I can chime in. Um, I, I you know not not sure if it's if it's been Carla's experience, but um, I, you know I find myself uh, you know again I study international relations and history at Brown. I think honestly, like being taught how to solve problems and address things is is really critical. I can just give one example. Uh, I remember we're doing this really interesting international negotiation class and um, talking about how do you negotiate in really tricky situations. And it was basically like when two sides both say, hey, I have this goal and I have this goal and it's, in, it's you know, it's, it's, it's a, you know, whatever the immovable force against the whatever stop on stubble wall, you know, it's, it's impossible to have overlap. And the, you know, the, the thought was, hey, digest, you know, pull the onion back until you basically can figure out what actually, hey, why do you need that? Why do you need that? I, and finally, you get kind of overlap of the Venn diagram of an actual solution that works for both sides. I do that probably on a daily basis, <laughs> you know, constantly, hey, a retailer says, I need this, I, or I can't do that. And we say, this is a better way. Um, and so you constantly have to be, hey, why do you think that? Why do you need to do this? You know, whether it's someone who's trying to get, you know, promotion at your company, a client that's trying to move forward, it's constant problem solving where at the surface, there's no possible answer and you have to find an answer. And that's every day. And Brown honestly taught me you know, with incredible spades to do that um, in the concept of in the field of international relations and kind of, you know, resolution, uh, diplomatic resolution, but it applies to business. It applies to interpersonal relations. Like you got to find a way to get to yes. And so I think part of the thing I learned when I first started business is the actual content of what you're doing is actually starts to be minimized. And a lot of what you do is just problem solve all the time. How do you hire the best people? How do you source the right, you know, how do you raise money? How do you do all these things that have nothing to do really with the problem you went out to solve? It's really important. You still have that kind of forefront, but you got to be constantly figuring out every morning you wake up and say, okay, I'm going to have to solve a problem and I'm going to have to, you know, make it happen. So certainly in that respect, Brown set me up incredibly well. Anything to add to that, Carla? Um, yeah, for me, I think it was just the power of diversity of thought. Um, you know, growing up in Ecuador, I had the same 21 classmates for 12 years. <laughs> it was like a little family. We still, we still uh, treat each other like brothers and sisters that, you know, arriving to Brown and just being surrounded by just so many diverse classmates, teachers, and the encouragement around diversity of thought and just the power of that. And um, to me, that was the most valuable, refreshing um, exposure I had and, and, and really my life, I, I wasn't used to that. It was always like one way of thinking, one way of dressing. Um, and that just, you know, I think through my life, it, um, I just 
then later wanted to expose myself only to that. Um, and really, you know, when, when I look at Kuyana, it's just like such a diverse place and um, just allows for, yeah, greatness to, to, to happen. Um, and yeah, my brown, my brown friends, I mean, Adam talked about one of our common friends, they're still there. I think that's one of the most supportive uh, uh, communities that it's just, you're, you're, yeah, you're, the people I met there are still there. We're still helping each other. Um, I just feel like that's, that's, that's so important in, in one's career and just lifetime. You reach out to somebody from Brown, you get an answer. And then, um, so it's, it's really awesome. It looks like we have one more question in the, uh, the chat. We might, this might be our last one as we're um, heading out in the hour. Um, how do you educate the consumer toward buying a better quality product, especially when they can't afford it? Yeah, we, um, that's a really hard thing to solve for, you know, and, um, and I'll be honest, right? We at Kuyana, not everybody will be able to afford our products. We do our best to write, um, uh, be as affordable as possible for the level of quality we sell. Um, but what we can do as a brand to do that is um, put less, we put less pressure on the customer to buy impulse or feel, feel like they, she's not worth it if she doesn't have it. I think that, you know, the fashion industry does a lot of, you need this, it's time to move on. Like this is the it bag, like this, you know, so constantly feeling like you're not you know, to keep up or to, to look good, you need to keep buying. Our approach is the entire opposite. And so I think, you know, for those who can't afford it's it is an intentional purchase. It is okay to take your time. And guess what? Like our products are not going to be uh, gone the, the next season. We actually produce best sellers, right? Some of our, like, our products will be there for a long time. Take your time. Um, the other thing is now there are uh, right new businesses coming up uh, with you know Afterpay for example, just like right. So so partnering with um, with players that can help finance those um, purchases has been also very helpful, um, so that those payments can be done in chunks. Um, so I think that's kind of like the two areas where we're focusing for that. And then the third one that I talked about is um, donation resale. There's a lot of opportunity we have there we haven't done we haven't you know kind of gone to the max potential there we're working on it but hopefully you know eventually we can be able to have a place where our products are resold uh, even lower price points so, so more people can buy it and um yeah i think they you know the best education really happens we can do as much as we can online it really happens i think from person to person and seeing how somebody lives with a high quality product and what that does for their life, right? That's like, I think the most trustworthy thing you can as, and as retailers, we can talk about it. We can, you know, show photography, um, but ultimately like being close to that really, I think just like, um, you know, shortens that gap uh, and of, of understanding what, you know, better quality can do for somebody's life. And just the fact that they'll buy less in the future. Yeah, no, nothing to add. I guess there's one um, just kind of quick point. I'm um, just kind of on a related note is um, I, I would say when we go, when we kind of come across um, various companies and innovators in the space, almost not all, but many of the companies we run into, they're doing really cool things in this space, have some connection to Brown. Um, and I'd say there's a lot of incredible entrepreneurs like Carla out there that are doing things that are good for the world and also good for business. And so I think personally, Brown is incredibly well suited to be like the epicenter of like um, for profit for good companies. Um, it's perfectly set up for it. Danny and team are doing a great job. So I would encourage it. I'm happy to talk to anyone ever for what it's worth. Um, and, you know, this is great. The world's going to, I think in 20 years, every company is going to be this way. And honestly, to see Brown lead the way and the people on this call be part of it, it's, it's, it's super exciting. So anyway, thanks for having me. I really enjoyed the, the panel and the conversation and, um, and look forward to, uh, let me know if we can ever talk again. I'm happy to help. Thank you, Adam. And thank you, Carla. Um, I already mentioned thank you to Don. We are thrilled to be hosting this. And uh, Don mentioned it. It's, it's not unusual for us to be focused on these kinds of topics. The way we define entrepreneurship, the way I have in 16 years of teaching it at Brown, is it's a structured process for solving problems. 
And as a result, we're attracting lots of students like the ones on this call who care a lot about identifying consequential problems and then figuring out solutions to them. And you too are such uh, emblematic examples of alumni who are doing that. And so we're really thrilled to have you both involved with the Nelson Center. Adam knows that once we get, um, once we sink our teeth into you, we, we don't let you, we, we don't let you go. And uh, and so Carla, if if you're willing, we we would love to have you back involved, more involved. And uh, if you say yes, we will definitely take oh you. Oh my up God, on. absolute yes, Danny. You have no idea. It's been, I mean, it's been, building. You know, from scratch has been tough. And my one of my goals once I would start to peek my head out was I want to go back to Brown. So I would love to. I'm so right. excited to to yeah and, and honored. Well, you can count on that, both of you. And uh, I hope that the next time we convene, as much as we love to do so two-dimensionally, we'll be doing th so three-dimensionally in the beautiful building we have depicted behind me. So thank you to everybody who came today, participated, asked uh, questions. And um, thank you again to Adam and Carla for being so generous uh, with their time and expertise. And um, we will see you at our next events coming up. You can always find out those at our website, entrepreneurship.brown.edu. Thanks, everybody. Have a Thank safe, you guys. healthy, and restful weekend. Yeah, Thank you. Have so a great much. weekend. Thanks Bye. again, Danny and team. Take care. Bye. Yeah.